So welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, my name is Lee Hussey from Irish Theatre Institute and to the left on my screen is Elaine Donnelly, the General Manager of Irish Theatre Institute. Um, we're delighted to have you here for the Group Information Clinic on Audio Content Creation. In a moment I'll introduce Angus Ogue McAnally who's going to um, do this session with you guys. But before that I just wanted to give you a little context on this. So we've been looking at group sessions over the last couple of weeks addressing some of the issues that have arisen um, as, as an outcome of all the problems with COVID-19. So one of the sessions earlier um, in this pandemic was uh, a session with Peter Daly. And that session was recorded and is available on the Irish Theatre Institute website. Um, please do follow us on Twitter and Facebook to make sure that you can hear about upcoming sessions and you'll also hear about the recordings. This session will be recorded and will be available on our website. Um, we are also remain, the group information clinic came from, we run information clinics with advice and assistance to independent artists in the sector. So do stay in touch with us. And if there is an issue that you're finding at the moment that you'd like to talk about, you can get in touch with us on our info email address, which I'll show at the end of this session. So I'm just going to check with Angus. Are you ready for me to hand over to you, Angus? Yes, indeed. Ready to rock. Hello, everybody. Hello, friends. Uh, this is fab. It's so great to see everybody. Uh, lots of familiar faces and uh, some new faces too, which is absolutely wonderful. Um, so look, we were aiming for this to, to go through about an hour, a little over an hour, and then some time for, uh, for a Q&A at the end. Um, if something urgently pressing pops up as we're going, please feel free to pop it in the chat. Uh, the chat window to the side of the screen and we will have the team from ICI kind of collating those and popping in. If it's something urgent that you pop in at the time, we might do that. Other than that, we'll try and hold it till the end for the Q&A session uh, and deal with them all there because there might be some crossover from questions uh, uh, whatever else then. Um, and I will offer this to the best of my ability in terms of, I, like we've done a lot of creating audio content over the last 10 years. Uh, and so just kind of some of the basic principles behind, behind how you can do this stuff and what it's useful for, maybe applications that you haven't considered before now. Uh, for some of you, this will be covering over ground that you're already very familiar with. For some of it, if some of you, it might be very new. Um, don't panic if we're lashing through stuff because we will email out a fact sheet with links to equipment and you know website videos and stuff like that to give you any of the information we're covering we'll email you out links to so you can not panic about taking notes or whatever we'll, we'll get all that stuff to you um and then i've got a bit of time for q a at the end and hopefully it will make sense and hopefully me using my little powerpoint thing will all work swimmingly because i don't usually use powerpoint things and we'll see how that works out so let me see if i i'll tell you what i might do i might go to my little screen share thing to kick us off and i will go to this oh it looks like it's gonna work fantastic uh so here we go um Right, so just a couple of things in terms of where we're going to go with this. Uh, the stuff that we've done in the past, we have done two 52 episode series of the Rise Productions Irish Theatre podcast. I think some of you out there have already been guests on that, so it's good to see you guys again. Um, and that was a series of interviews with theatre practitioners from producers to actors to writers, directors, administrators, stage managers, whatever else. Uh, and we did those like five years apart to year long projects. Uh, we all, we've also done two 10 episode series of short audio drama, little kind of five, six, seven minute monologues. Um, we did the radio adaptation of Fight Night, which was the first show that Rise did, that Gavin Costick wrote for us. Uh, and also for The Fringe in 2017, we made uh, a five part audio fantasy adventure for young audiences podcast thing called Cobra's Quest. So we it's a reasonable spread of stuff and uh, in terms of kind of that, that interview format through to straight up traditional radio drama, through to short form stuff, through to stuff for younger audiences. And that's going to just give you, not to boast about, look at all the great stuff we've done. That's just about, there are, uh, there's a broad spectrum of applications for this. And there's an awful lot of opportunity there, uh, given that we're all looking for maybe new ways of making work at the moment or new avenues. Uh, so it just, it's going to start thinking, okay, well, what's possible uh, in terms of, what we can create because obviously this audio format particularly that we can disseminate digitally 
means we can get it to people without having to come in contact and come together as a traditional audience in a room, which makes it um, very useful at the moment. So in terms of what we're going to cover today, we will go through the gear um, and sourcing the right equipment for your budget, including working with what you already have. This will be a key point, um, particularly because none of us are earning at the moment. So dropping thousands of pounds on gear may not be the right thing to do. Uh, we'll talk about the environment in which you'll be recording, possibly acoustically treating some of the spaces you'll be recording in. Um, I'll do a, a quick basic run over of editing some stuff together. Again, that might be covering ground that some of you are very familiar with, but for some of you, it might be very new. And you might be thinking, Jesus, I'm nowhere near tech savvy enough to edit together uh, an audio drama like that. I wouldn't even know where to start. And hopefully we'll be able to show you that it's a bit more straightforward and simple than you may have feared. Uh, and then the applications of where we might be able to use this, some of the contexts where this can be a benefit. Uh, so that's the thing. But one of the key messages we want to take from today is you probably already have the equipment to make broadcast quality content. Okay. So if you're sitting there panicking that you might have to drop hundreds or thousands of quid uh, on, uh, on equipment, don't be panicking. Uh, okay. There's, there's every chance that what you already have will make sense. Uh, if any of you got a chance to listen to Drive Time on RTE Radio 1 recently, they were doing a series of local history reports where people within their two kilometer radius were reporting about the local history of their place. That was recorded on people's smartphones, out and about walking in nature, and it was broadcast on your national broadcaster, okay? So not just, oh, well, any port of a storm during the pandemic that was acceptable, that the level of mics in most smartphones at the moment is of sufficient quality to be doing an awful lot of the stuff that you might need to do. So you may not need to spend a penny from where you are, which is great news. Um, obviously, there are options uh, to upgrade, and we'll talk a bit about those. And obviously, there are some scenarios where if we're talking about recording voiceovers for you know TV and radio adverts at home, that we may well need to... Um, that we may well need to, uh, to upgrade some of that stuff, but we can talk about that in a minute. Okay, um, so that's, uh, that's just one of the principles I wanted to, so just to kind of remove a bit of the panic, maybe, uh, that just to, to not be worrying about that. Uh, and the second thing, just to, to, drop, to drop this concept, stop thinking about trying to achieve studio quality audio in your own house. It's not gonna happen, okay? Because let's face it, if you wanted to match what a studio is doing, you're looking at five, six grand minimum in terms of audio treatment of the room. You're talking about a thousand pounds for a studio grade microphone. You're talking about audio interfaces, mixing desks, everything else. And also you're talking about qualifying as a sound engineer in order to be mixing that yourself. So stop it, okay? Forget it. Don't worry about it. The good news is though, that you can, it's that all these additional bells and whistles are like the last 10% and we can get 90% of the way there or 95% of the way there for much, much less time and effort and money, okay? It's, it's that last little bit of, you know, for, for really good world-class sprinters with the best coaches and the best nutrition plans and the best training regimes, even if they train seven days a week, they're not going to get to Usain Bolt because Usain Bolt is Usain Bolt, okay? So accept that we're not going to get studio quality stuff in your own house, unless you're willing to spend that time and that money. Maybe some of you have 10 grand in your arse pocket to kid out the house. But if you're renting or sharing a room somewhere, you know, you're not going to kid out a spare room if you don't have a spare room. And if you're going to have to move in six months time when your landlord ups the rent again, you know, we're going to be smart about these things. So let, let that concept go is what I'd say. Uh, so, We'll make a start on some of the gear. This has been the kind of the evolution of my gear over the years. I started off on the podcast stuff with the blue snowball, which strangely enough is that snowball looking uh, mic there. Um, and then I evolved through up to what I'm now using for most of the stuff I do is the, is the Zoom H6, which you can see there with the pop filter in front of it. Um, so to take a look at the snowball for a second, these, when I bought this, it was about 50 quid. Uh, it seems to be knocking around 70 quid now. Now, whether that's a, a tech upgrade uh, and they've just improved the machine itself, I don't know, or if it's just what I think has been happening. 
is that in the pandemic with everyone looking to record from home and every you know pro wrestling nerd wanting to start their own wrestling podcast uh, just people have been buying these things they've been selling out uh, and so people have been doing a little bit of price gouging so mind yourself on that but this is a really straightforward basic entry level uh, USB microphone I'll talk a bit more about the difference between USB and XLR in a minute but as a USB mic it is literally plug and play you pay your 50 60 70 quid you take it out of the box you stick it into your laptop through the USB and you are green for go and um, for those of you listening to me now I'm doing this and I'm doing this in the kitchen which is quite echoey but I'm doing this on the blue snowball so the, the level of audio you're getting from me now is via that snowball okay uh, not the poshest mic I have in my arsenal but um, a useful entry level quick upgrade um, it, you know, as a step up from just using the built-in mic on your phone or on your laptop. Um, from there, I'll, I'll just take you through the evolution of where I went through because it'll cover a lot of the stuff we want to talk about. I moved up from the Snowball to the Zoom H2N. I am a massive uh, fan of Zooms. They are, so they're, they're field recorders in that you can take them out and about to record stuff on location. Um, and, but they also work as, an, as a, a USB mic, basically. The Zoom H2N is not even 150 quid, but is an excellent piece of kit. It, it will work um, directionally, what they call cardioid, which is for voiceover stuff, just picking up straight ahead. Uh, it'll work in full surround sound in you know, all 360 degrees. Uh, it'll work in a mid-side mode, which is where you can play with the stereoscope and stuff as well. It's an incredible piece of kit for very, very little money. Um, and I would have recorded uh, the second half of the first series of the podcast on that. I would have recorded a lot of Cobra's Quest on that as well. Um, it's, it's a fantastic machine. The upgrade from there is to the Zoom H4N, uh, where this gets interesting is that it has those onboard mics in an XY position, which gives you great stereo stuff. Also, you can alter them from a tighter 90 degree angle out to a wider 120 degree angle. This may sound an awful lot of technical stuff here. I'm hoping I'm not bombarding people with that. Um, but also the key thing about the Zoom is, the Zoom H4N is it has two XLR inputs. And this is where we start getting into some of the big boy stuff. So to talk briefly about XLR mics versus USB mics, the XLR connection is the standard microphone connection that you know and love from any time you've used a mic anywhere in the world. Um, the USB is for going straight into laptops um, and it will power stuff via that. Uh, the XLR mics tend to be the higher end of the range, better quality, shall we say, um, but oftentimes they will need, uh, they'll need power, they'll need phantom power. And so if you're in the market for, for buying stuff and you do keep an eye out for connections because if you're just buying a standard USB mic, it'll plug straight into the laptop It'll be powered by the laptop and you'll be fine. If you're going for an XLR connection, you may well need phantom power and you will need an audio interface. You're not gonna plug an XLR straight into the laptop. Um, there are some XLR to USB converter cables. I've never used them and I wouldn't have a huge amount of faith in them. Um, and so this is where the zooms kind of come into their own. Because those zooms have XLR inputs, they can be used as the audio interface. And they've got pretty good preamps uh, built into the zooms. So not, not the H2N, I have to say. So from the H4N, the H5N, and the H6 uh, will have XLR inputs. So if you wanted, I, like I, so I'm using most of the stuff that I do, and I have stuff on air at the moment on, on radio and TV that was recorded on the, the, the Zoom H6. Um, it's, it's sufficient to get to broadcast quality. Um, so if you wanted to buy one of those field recorders, you have it as a handy thing to take around with you, but also if you wanted to then upgrade to a, a posher XLR mic, it's there as the interface for you. So it's not wasted money that you have to go again. The interface is already there. You're just talking about buying the microphone. Um, I've now upgraded to this, the H6. This is what I do all of my stuff on at the moment. The reason I went up from the H4 to the H6 was very simply because it had additional XLR inputs. Uh, and some of the interview stuff that I do, if it's to more than two guests, I needed separate channels uh, to be able to have different people speak at different levels and have control of that in the mix afterwards. Maybe a lot of the stuff that you'll be doing won't need that level of, 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 uh, of inputs or whatever else, but if you think that you might like to have it, um, then it can, be, it can be very useful. The thing with the Zooms as well is a lot of people use them on short films in that because they can connect via a hot shoe connection to the top of the camera 
Um, as you can see there, there's kind of the, the shotgun light capsule connects in, which is good for um, directional stuff like that. Uh, so that's, you know, they, they have a lot of applications and the joy of being able to take them out into the field is uh, it's entirely portable and self-contained. You don't need to be plugging it into a laptop to make it work. Whereas a standalone USB mic, you will need to lug the laptop around with you everywhere you go. Um, so kind of part of the joy around all this stuff is the democratization of, uh, of the gear. So if you think of that uh, Irish theater podcast that I did, um, where you know we were sitting down with these hour long interviews every week, if I had wanted to do that through traditional broadcast means, it would have meant going to RTE, pitching it to them, securing a budget, having a team of four researchers, whatever else, needing access to the studios and all that, and kind of getting through those gatekeepers. The joys of what have ha has happened over the last 10 or 15 years is that this has all been democratized. That idea of, you know, citizen journalist and whatever else. We can now get out and do what we want to do uh, based on... Uh, based on what we have already, whether that's just taking the iPhone out to film stuff or whether it's um, recording stuff like this from home, which is brilliant in a lot of ways. Now, also it brings us to that great thing of just because you can, it doesn't mean you should. Like, you know, the idea of everyone starting their own podcast, but it's there as an option to you now. It has been democratized down and at price points that are really, really accessible. Because as I said, like for a lot of you, we're looking at... Um, we're looking at zero cost in some instances. Just to say very quickly in terms of the chat, if I'll, I'll be popping in and out of the PowerPoint feed to come back to me for some of the chats, just so it feels a little less impersonal. We're not just staring at the same picture all the time, so don't, don't panic if the, if the PowerPoint goes again. Um, so uh, I'll go jump back into this for a second um, because some of you who do a lot of VO work will notice that at this stage, I haven't been talking about the famous uh, large diaphragm condenser microphones. Um, and these would be kind of the gold standard in terms of uh, voiceover stuff in studios. So if we're talking specifically about uh, doing VO work for uh, commercials, be that radio or TV, or you know, maybe narrating audio books, things like that, um, it, this, this is what some people will be looking to do. As I said, I have stuff on air at the moment that I did through the Zoom H6. It's not... Uh, a large, so th when they say the large diaphragm, that's literally the capsule within the mic that picks up the incoming sound waves. And obviously the bigger it is, the more kind of fidelity they can have. Uh, and there's the thing with the large, the large diaphragm condenser microphones is they have what they call the proximity effect, which is where you get right up close to the microphone and do that um, movie trailer voice guy thing in a world. Um, so, uh, so some people may feel that that's a prerequisite for, uh, for doing like you know more straight up voiceover stuff i don't know that it is i'm getting away without it at the moment um but that's that's up for grabs the other thing to say is a lot of these will be xlr connections so make sure that you do if you want to be going and get one of those that you need to be having an audio interface for it uh, there are usb large diaphragm condenser microphones but i think you might need to spend a few bob on those um to make them make sense i mean the entry level stuff it just won't have the power to do what it needs to do um as ever use a bit of common sense, uh, Google it, read Amazon reviews, um, try and find a lot of YouTube videos, a lot on this stuff uh, for the information is out there. Do a bit of research on it if you're thinking about um, branching out. But in terms of getting up to studio grade stuff, you are looking at the looks of a thousand pounds. And I think what will come to the recording environment later, I think maybe getting up to that level won't really make sense because the environment won't be up to spec to match the mic. And effectively, I think it's the equivalent of buying a Ferrari and running it on laundered diesel. Um, I think a mic of that, of that caliber is probably going to show up the deficiencies more than give you the level that, what, you know, or that help you in what you need. Um, so that, and then in terms of other stuff, equipment that you might need, um, most, a lot of these come with their own stands, just a desktop stand, which is fine. But I think a boom arm uh, like this might be more useful for you in terms of getting it out of the way so you can have scripts in front of you or iPads or whatever you want to be working with at the time. Um, and if you look in that, that bottom right hand mic there, you'll see it's kind of built into a shock mount. A lot of the upper level mics will come with their own shock mount, um, which again, just kind of uh, alleviates any bumping of the table or, or anything like that. Um, a pop filter as well, which we can see back in, uh, in this one here, that pop filter in front of the Zoom um, is pretty essential as well. Uh, a pop filter, what it does is for kind of plosive consonants, um, you can attack the mic a bit much and it'll, it'll pop the mic. 
that just helps uh, alleviate that issue, which is a useful thing. Um, is that all making sense so far? Everybody following us so far? We're in good form. Hopefully it's not covering too much ground that you're all really familiar with, and hopefully it's not wildly uh, baffling. I, I presume it's not. Uh, we'll keep going. So uh, as we crack on, the environment or uh, like acoustic treatment for where you might be recording. So as a general rule, um, we're staying away from kitchens and bathrooms, he said from his kitchen. Uh, so what we want to be doing is, uh, what you want to avoid is hard surfaces. Um, so wood floors, tiled bathrooms, you know, the kitchen units in a kitchen, they're all gonna reflect the sound around and it'll get very echoey very quickly. Um, and is that's not your friend. Um, you know, while singing in the shower makes you sound better because of the reverb, uh, that's great in that particular context but that's not exclusively what we're talking about here. Uh, in an ideal world, you want as clean a sound as possible. Um, so you want what they call as dead a sound as possible. So a, a room like a kitchen or a bathroom, they say is quite live because it echoes around, the sound bounces across, whereas a, a more dead room will absorb much more of the sound and remove the echo. So uh, yeah, stay away from the kitchen and the bathroom. What you're looking for is a bedroom or a sitting room. You're looking for as much in the way of curtains and sofas and mattresses and duvets and carpets as possible. Um, because what it'll do is it'll soak up a lot of the sound uh, and stop it bouncing back in through the mic and, uh, and causing that delay. Uh, I'll get back into the little screen sharing thing here now. Where am I? Here I am, okay. Uh, so, uh, in terms of acoustically treating where you might be recording, there are these modular booths that you can have from home, but you are looking at four or five or six grand for them. Uh, and I, like, I just, I can't imagine the level of stuff you'd need to be doing from home to justify that. Now look, if you live on the Aran Islands um, and you're also, I don't know, Brenda Fricker and someone's going to be paying you loads of money for stuff. Maybe it's a great investment. Um, but if you're sharing a three bed in Cabra, where are you going to put that? Okay. So let's be smart about this. Um, and and I, I mean, you know, look, that will get you up to the upper level. If any of you have five grand in your arse pocket, please feel free to fire ahead and take all our work. Um, you'll be grand. Um, as we look down bottom left here, those kind of standard acoustic foam tiles that you'll see in recording studios if you're ever in there um, and they sell them you know fairly cheaply on amazon and stuff i have a few of them here i wouldn't be putting a massive investment into those because they're not going to do enough for you what they'll do is because they're as they're not as dense as uh, as traditional soundproofing would be um, so they'll pick up the high frequencies but a lot of the basier stuff they just won't absorb um, so it's it's only going to do so much for you. If you look at that bottom right, those kind of professional grade um, acoustic panels, you can buy them and they're expensive, but they're very effective. Uh, and you don't have to completely cover the entire room you're working in. A few of those strategically placed would be your friend. Um, but equally, if you wanted to and you were so inclined, you can make them yourself. If you go to a DIY shop and buy um, acoustic insulation rather than kind of standard insulation for your attic or whatever uh, to keep heat in. There is, there is acoustic insulation um, and you can make them fairly cheaply with cheap cuts of wood, you know, wrap them over with fabric uh, because it's a much denser material that will absorb uh, a much broader spectrum of the frequencies. Um, and even if you just did, you know, two of those to put into a little corner of a spare room or a corner of your bedroom that you don't even have to mount on the wall, you just have them, you can take them out. Uh, that, that could be very useful for you. Now look, total disclaimer, when I'm recording stuff here, I tend to just grab a few spare pillows off the bed and put them behind the mic. Because again, it's not gonna do 100% as good a job as you know 500 euros worth of acoustic panels, but it's gonna do about 90% of it and it's cost you nothing. So again, uh, you know, have, be smart about what you're doing. Um, you know, a lot of the stuff, you know, I, I think there is value in splashing out three, four, 500 quid on mics and gear and equipment if you are regularly getting VO work, because essentially at, at three or four or 500 quid, one gig is gonna pay for it. So you go, okay, this is now covered and we're gonna, we're gonna make money off it from here. The other thing is, you know, I, I don't see us recording from home uh, in terms of commercial voiceover stuff forever. I think uh, that's one of the situations because of the nature of social distancing, because you're literally locked in a booth, 
uh, I think we'll be able to get back to that relatively quickly, uh, you know, in relation to, you know, compared to theater or TV or whatever. Um, so I don't know that this is the time to go, ah, this is my 20 year investment. I think just be, be smart about, about that kind of stuff. Um, I want to talk briefly about these fellas. Um, a lot of you will have seen these before if you've done any voiceover stuff in studios um, or you, your friend might have suggested getting one if you were buying a, a mic for home. Uh, what I'd say about these is the jury's kind of out on their efficacy because if you're doing voiceover work, the microphone is going to be in what they call a cardioid pattern, which means it's only receiving sound from the very front. It's not receiving sound from the sides and the back. And if you look at where that shield is going, it's covering the sides and the back. So what, it's, what that will do is it'll soak up a lot of your voice as you're speaking into the mic, but it won't soak it all up. And that voice is going to bounce off the wall, bounce back off the wall behind you, and bounce back into the front of the mic. Uh, and that's what's going to cause the reverb. So this brings us basically to the phenomenon of the duvet over your head. Now, that might sound a bit crazy, but for generations, um, journalists, podcasters uh, all around the world have been doing VOs from hotel rooms with a duvet over their heads um, because it does a lot of the work. And, um, you know, it, it's primitive. It's not particularly comfortable under there. It gets a bit hot and sweaty. Uh, it's hard to get a light in there. You know, we rustling pages of scripts. But many of us have done it, have done it and many of us will continue to do it. So as you know, kind of in an emergency, it works really well. Even not an emergency, it kind of works okay. Um, but there are ways, there are ways of kind of formalizing or mildly upgrading the duvet over the head scenario. Um, which is, and you'll see kind of tutorials around this on, on YouTube of kind of making your own DIY home studio booth. Um, and you'll get plans on, on YouTube as well. I'll send through some of the links. But one of the ways is, just, is essentially PVC piping that you essentially make a, a four foot by four foot telephone box out of Wavin pipes. Uh, and then you spend a couple of hundred quid on proper um, acoustic treatment curtains. And like a big shower cubicle, you wrap the curtains around all four sides and over the top. And that will do a huge amount in terms of dampening out the buses driving past your window from the outside and also do a huge amount in terms of keeping the sound within that booth so you're not getting that crazy echo reverb thing. Um, you know, I think that's the level of investment where it might make sense to drop 250 quid on it if you had that uh, going. Because it's the kind of thing, it's only in PVC pipes, you can dismantle it and put it back together very quickly. It doesn't need to be taken up a huge portion of your flat the whole time. Um, it's not a massive financial investment, but would do a huge amount towards getting you towards that five grand booth, but only spending 250 quid, not five grand. That to me seems like a bit of a no brainer or certainly uh, a smart financial move, if nothing else. Um, you know, there, people do talk about kind of just sticking the mic in a wardrobe because you know, if you'll, you'll have clothes and stuff in a wardrobe and it keeps it in a, a small space, it can be a bit tricky if you've only got light summer t-shirts or blouses or whatever people wear, I don't know, in a wardrobe, it's not going to soak up a huge amount. If you've a load of big, heavy winter coats, it's going to be a bit more dense and soak up a bit more. Um, the risk is that it might sound like you're just talking in a tiny little room and it'll be a bit boxy. So you got to watch out for that. But the good thing is play around with it a bit. If like without spending a penny, have your mobile phone. Just for yourself today, if you want after this, spend 15 minutes, go and record the opening lines of Merchant of Venice in your bathroom, in your kitchen, in your bedroom, and sticking your head into your wardrobe and see the difference that that's making. You can start to play around with it a bit and go, oh, okay, that's kind of food for thought uh, on some of those things. Um, worth it just for uh, uh, looking at it, I think, a bit. Okay, let me jump back to this. Uh, are we all good so far? We're all happy we're not panicking, it's making sense? Okay, good stuff. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about editing and how we will construct the audio content. Um, so what I might do, excuse me, I'll have a drink of energy drink. Um, what I might do is I might just edit some stuff together live to kind of demystify some of this uh, in case anybody thinks it's, it's wildly um, difficult. So I'm gonna pop into GarageBand. GarageBand and composition program that's built into Max. You get it for free from the App Store. 
Uh, if you're not on Mac and you're on PC, um, you can get a thing called Audacity, which again is free to download, very intuitive and easy to use in terms of editing stuff together. Um, my daughter just got an iPad and the garage band on iPad is even better than it is on a MacBook. So you, there's, so again, back to, that, back to that kind of concept of you may well have everything you already need. Like, okay, sure, we could all go and buy Pro Tools as, a, as an editing software or whatever else if we wanted to, but I think you're gonna get most of what you need from free software that you already have. So just to, to, to kind of put some stuff together here, um, what I'll do is I'll just get into recording a little bit here um, and we'll just do a little bit of editing to show you how some stuff could come together. So uh, this is me now recording into the mic for GarageBand and I'm gonna fluff my lines briefly, oh no. So I'm gonna do the edit on that. So what I might do is I give myself three quick clicks to give me a visual point on the waveform, just so it's easier for me to edit back in. Uh, and then I'll pick it up and start again uh, with some more voice. So that's just me putting that in. So if you take a look there, you can see where those three clicks are, I presume. Um, as an easy edit point so that we can get in. So uh, as we play this back, I can jump in here, spot those three clicks very easily. Uh, I can... Angus, we can see your um, PowerPoint rather than the, the point ah, of the screen that you're editing. Okay. Um, so let me jump back in. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll get that right for you now. Sorry, guys. Thank you for the heads up on that. Let me no go worries. Speak. Here we go. Now we're talking. So, uh, so if, as we look there, can you guys can see these three clicks here showing up in the waveform? So that's just a little handy visual marker for me. If I'm doing a longer read, if I'm doing a, a four minute narrative for some pharmaceutical company about whatever, and I want to do a few pickups, that's a little quick visual guide. So I can jump in there, hit that edit point, um, pull out where, you know, wherever I've done the fluff, uh, there it is. And then if we go up here to edit, there's a, like simple things like delete and move, which will pull out that bit and slide the next part back to it so that you get it there. And it'll just, that'll now run through. So, uh, so I mean, it, it is straightforward and simple. What we can do with this then is start throwing in additional tracks because say we were doing, um, Say we were doing an audio drama and we wanted to open with uh, some kind of a SIG tune or something. So what we can do here is, oh, let me move this out of the way. Uh, I just want to bump this up for my screen. Okay. So with this new track, we could have, uh, we can put in SIG tunes, we can do, uh, we can do all kinds of stuff. Let me just jump in here. Where am I going? Where has this gone from here? Sorry, guys, bear with me one sec. Uh, so what we can do is... Where, you can tell I'm going to be mixing it in a while. Uh, okay, what I'll do is... So we can imagine that track that's there already is say the sig tune coming in. We open up a new track and we can record in that. So as that sig tune is there, is gonna, is gonna fade out. We pop into our little recording session here. And We're now recording on the new track underneath so, it. And we go in here and we start off the episode of the new podcast and it's doing its own thing. So then on a really straightforward basis, what we have now is, say that's the sig tune opening us up, come in and then we've got the new audio intro coming in here. At that point, if we jump into the mix here and show automation, we can see this line for the volume here and just gradually fade that out. So if you can imagine that's the end of the sig tune fading out and the voiceover coming in then after that. Uh, we can also then start to input uh, anything else we want. Like if we're doing, say if we're trying to do an audio drama, that what we can do is we can start to bring in uh, we can start to bring in special effects. Uh, there's a load of places to access special effects and stuff online uh, for free um, and uh, royalty free as well, so that you can start to put this stuff together. And the, all this software is is much more intuitive than you might think it is. A lot of it's just kind of drag and drop, um, where you can bring in. 
Um, you can bring in music for the first. Obviously, you need to have the rights to be using music and stuff if you're going to be um, disseminating it. But uh, there's there's huge scope there to um, there's huge scope there to be doing it. Uh, what you can also do is, depending on how you record it, um, what you should be able to do is you can play around with the stereo field of it. So if you know on some of those Zoom recorders they can do full surround sound 360 degrees and it'll be there but like i said if you want to have clean tracks of each individual what you can do is uh we can get into the pan of it here and so i can send this person way off to the right or way off to the left if we want uh, so if you were doing say some kind of audio drama content and you wanted people to be arriving into the scene you can have them starting off further left and then bringing them more central as the speech continues. Uh, or you can have, or if you're having like a, a, just a duologue scene between two people, instead of having both of them front and center, have one of them slightly off if you want to foreground someone uh, in the scene and have someone else then off in the stereo mix. And as someone's listening on headphones, it, it feels a bit more geographically placed. It feels a bit more uh, real world. And also it gives you control as the artist in terms of the way you would direct a piece for stage or choreograph a piece of dance, it gives you scope to try and uh, to have that level of control rather than just have it wash over people. You can choose to steer people's focus and attention in different ways. Um, so it's just, it's about helping with those storytelling tools that we use in our own disciplines, say in theater or dance or in, in film or whatever else, and applying it to this medium, that there are techniques and tricks there that you can do. Um, the important thing to remember about putting audio stuff together is uh, you need to be careful about your mindset as you're constructing the piece because people, in the way that we have the visual clues from either stage or from screen, here, if someone enters to sneak up behind someone, unless they speak, we don't know. Okay, I mean, we can put in footsteps or whatever, to, you know, if, if you want to do that. But you can't have, the, the, there isn't the same leeway as you have on stage to trust that the visual clues are going to do stuff for us. Now, that might sound like a bit of a disadvantage. And so it means that in, it, it can feel like you get tripped into going a little bit clunky. Going, oh, George, you have returned. It is great to have you back. I see you now have a long beard. You know, that we want to avoid that where possible. Um, but what it does is it, it really frees us up in the idea that if we were shooting a short film and we wanted to jump locations from the middle of a courtroom where someone feels they're drowning under the pressure to a stylized underwater shoot, that's going to cost us thousands and we're going to have to you know, book you know, Olympic swimming pools and all that kind of stuff. Whereas here, with some simple sound effects, we can make that same thing happen. So in some respects, for those of us who may for the last decade have been making theater on an absolute shoestring with zero budget and no chance to do what we wanted to do, we can maybe dream a bit bigger, you know? Uh, and rather than have to pay a cast of 12 to rehearse for four weeks, if you get someone who can do enough with their voice to play three or four different characters convincingly, suddenly we have four actors playing a cast of 12. We have, uh, you know, and we don't have to rehearse for four weeks. We can do it script in hand. We can, do it, we can get it put together very quickly and very easily. Um, if you know if you want in terms of hearing what this can sound like uh, again we'll send you through the links but on the on the rise website that cobra's quest um thing we did for young audiences that was all recorded not even on the posh zoom but on the real basic zoom essentially me just because it was me calling in favors from the friends so it's essentially it's me going to ian lloyd anderson's house or kate gilmore's house going say these lines into this mic in and out in an hour uh, and having it all sorted so um, as social distancing guidelines get relaxed a little bit and we can get a little bit closer to people, there will be scope to make a lot of this stuff pretty easily. Um, and if only to kind of flex the creative muscles or to give us something to focus on at the moment, when we can't get in a rehearsal room or a dance studio or, you know, we, we can't be on a location filming something, this, this might be something that's a useful avenue. And I think looking at it fresh might open up stuff that, you know, that we wouldn't have thought of before uh, in terms of how we can use it. Um, so I think, I, think that's, I think that's kind of useful. Um, I think rather than kind of going through much more of the editing stuff and putting it together and laying tracks, does it make sense to kind of move on to talk about some of the applications maybe? Yeah, okay. So 
Uh, oh, let me go to my little share screen here and I'll bump back over to this. Okay. Yes, there we go. So, in terms of applications, obviously there's the standard straight up radio drama. You know, for those of us, uh, those of us who've, who, who work in, in theatre particularly, will know that there has been an increasing trend uh, over the last while uh, in terms of making radio adaptations of, of plays. Um, certainly for solo plays, where it's going to direct address to the audience, that lends itself much cleaner to it because it's direct address to the audience so we can do it um, in the audio play format. Um, but uh, there's quite a few, even two actors have done it. Now look, not every play is going to be suitable for that adaptation. But with a few small tweaks, your play might be. And I'm a big fan of monetizing the ever-living Jesus out of the work because we've put the work in, lads. Why not get the financial reward for it? It's seldom enough that we do. And so the, like the whole point of the initial setup costs of the, you know, the creative inspiration, the labor of getting it to where it is and getting it up on stage, that's all been put in anyway. So we, we'd all love to have 10 week runs to monetize it out the far side of that. A lot of us can't sustain that, but here's another avenue to do it. Um, and there are, it's, it's not just the case that you'd have to go to Kevin Reynolds in RTE and say, hey, will you please let me do my play here? There are significant opportunities outside of that. I mean, from a basic level, just goes full punk rock DIY, record it yourself with your friends, edit it together basically on the software that you get for free, and then, you know, live stream it or do it as a podcast where people pay a pound to download or whatever, or a tip jar for a live stream or something. You could do it that way. But also, there is a significant amount of BAI funding, uh, the Broadcasting Association of Ireland, and they are fast tracking the next few rounds of funding to get money out into the sector. Uh, what you need is, it's like a standard Arts Council application to get it in, but also you need a broadcast commitment from uh, a radio station. But thankfully, a lot, of, uh, a lot of stations outside the ones you might typically expect are now doing that. So places like Near FM, you know, here on the north side of Dublin, are doing a lot of stuff now. Um, I know... Who was it? There was someone in the West. It might have been Shannon Side were winning awards internationally for some of their radio drama recently. Um, News Talk does quite a bit um, that they don't necessarily shout about, but you'll catch it on bank holiday afternoons and stuff. So there's avenues there to get real money um, where you can pay your friends to do it for real and pay for proper sound engineers. Um, and, and like I said, you know, whatever about creating new works from scratch, uh, if you have pre-existing work, that you think with a slight tweak here and there, so, okay, we can't use that visual gag anymore, but we can do a little line tweak here and there. Solo shows, two-handers, um, even bigger ones uh, can be adapted fairly easily. And I think to some extent it's money for El Rope um, because you've already done the work on it. Um, but also for those of us who write and produce or whatever else, that's another writer's fee and another performer's fee. Uh, which is no harm because I like to eat every day uh, and making a few bob is no sin in this game. Let's never forget. So look, that's, that's, one, of the, um, that's one of the applications we can look at. Uh, what else have I on my magical list? Here we go. Uh, devising. So I don't do a whole lot of devising work, um, but I know others do. And I think it's a really useful tool to have. If you want to be up on the floor, improv with someone. Um, in the way that, you know, memory cards on cameras can run out really quickly, even just setting up your phone running as you're up on the floor uh, doing improv, like the voice recorder on your phone will get a huge amount of this so that you can bounce ideas back and forth um, and then rather than go, oh, Jesus, what was that line? What was that little exchange? It was brilliant. We did it earlier on. Just go back and listen to the tape and do it and work it from there. Um, I think that's I think that's a really useful tool in terms of generating work that you don't because what it does is you don't need to worry about someone being in the room jotting stuff down as you go. You can do it all um, retrospectively, and it just it gives you an additional level of freedom. Um, I'll talk a bit more about that in another context now in a second. Um, but I think I think it's a really useful one to bear in mind uh, in terms of devising work that it can be a, a great tool for generating stuff. This is another one of it now, the idea of like mentorship and masterclasses. Because uh, if, if you get a chance to say, listen, Anne Clark of Landmark, 
I'm a huge fan of yours and how you balance the commercial stuff with the artistic stuff. Would you do a coffee with me and just let me pick your brain for half an hour? And graciously, she says yes. If you have to spend your entire time of that half an hour with your head in the notebook and making sure you're getting down the right stuff and scribbling down links and whatever else, okay, you might get a fair amount of use out of it, but wouldn't it be infinitely preferable to just hit record, put your little Zoom recorder down, as long as people are up for it and willing, um, and then just have a conversation with someone where you can follow those little tangents, where you go, actually, sorry, I never knew about that. Tell me a bit more about that, rather than being worried about scribbling it down. Um, or even if you get the chance for, uh, you know, if you're looking at mentorship and workshops and that kind of thing, if you have access to someone, the idea that you can record it and then disseminate it, whether that's just going back to your past, going, you won't believe this. Marco Rowe said he'd give me 45 minutes of his time to talk about Made in China. You go and meet him and bring it back to the rehearsal room and we can all have a listen to this on, on day one. So we start getting these ideas. We're all on the same, on the same shared page. Um, it's, it's little tiny applications like this in terms of the audio stuff that I find really, really useful. Um, uh, I think it's, it's a little bit of thinking outside the box or looking at it in a different way but it can be hugely beneficial of just having it there and it frees you up. Another thing to say on that is um, with the Zooms, uh, because you can just put it down in the center of a table, it's not the same as someone sticking a microphone in your face going, tell me all about this, which you know yourself, even experienced theater actors, if you put a camera in their face, oftentimes they can freeze up a little bit. It's the same with a microphone because you go, oh Jesus, now I'm being recorded. Um, so the idea of a Zoom, a Zoom just sitting on the table uh, is really easy. When I do um, a lot of the interview stuff, I use clip-on lapel mics rather than having people using handheld stuff because at that point you forget that the mic is clipped on, you're relaxing, you just do what you want to do. Uh, and it means you can get a much more natural conversation out of people, which I find, uh, which I find very useful. Um, and also you don't have to worry about people who are inexperienced with microphone technique, you know, moving microphones away from their mouth and, and sound levels popping up and down. It's nice to have it there as a security blanket if that interview thing uh, is something you guys might like to pursue in terms of audio stuff that you might be creating. Let me see what's next on my list. Because uh, I don't know what's next on my list. Uh, what did I say next? Uh, oh, advertising and promoting and then archive. Yeah, so advertising and promoting is an interesting one. I would love to say that the reason I did the Irish Theatre podcast was because I'm an altruistic uh, saint who loves Irish theatre and really wanted to give back to the community and create a, an invaluable archive. I did. I also wanted an hour-long infomercial for Rise Productions every week for a solid year. I'm not an idiot, okay? Uh, I realized that I was caught in that catch-22 of I can't get Arts Council money without a track record for creating work, and I can't get a track record for creating work until I get the funding. So I invented a brand, um, and, and I used it to get Rise Productions out there. Now, purely anecdotally, when I started that podcast, I hadn't worked in the Abbey in like three years, maybe. And within three months, I was casting a show at the Abbey. Now, do I think, you know, people in the Abbey will listen to podcasts about, ah, now we'll have Angle back? No. But being out there, being in the ether, being a person, work begets work and all that stuff, there is an element of being able to just make stuff happen. Um, and it's a big, it kind of ethos wise for me, it's a big thing that I kind of clocked 10 years ago. I had a load of friends who were getting TV series greenlit, a load of friends who were winning awards internationally for their theater stuff, a load of friends who were making big waves. And I had no friends who had a manuscript in a drawer going, just, I can't get anybody to look at it. No one will, no publisher will touch it. I had no friend going, I just can't break through. And it was at that point that I realized the difference is not necessarily excellence. The difference is in getting it done simply getting the work out there. And I think this audio medium is a really cost-effective and time-effective way of getting content out there. Um, and so I think it's a really useful, really valuable thing. Um, so in terms of promoting shows and stuff, um, some of you might have heard when Gavin Kostick was doing uh, his Fringe show uh, based on all the Greek mythology, he went back and did a full translation of The Odyssey. Uh, and as part of that, asked me to come and record it and put it out as a podcast uh, at weekly intervals in the run-up to the show. And so in some respects, you're going, hey, great, free content from an award-winning writer. This is really good and valuable for our audience. But also, it's buying investment from that audience. It's getting them attuned to the world of the Greek mythology, 
to go, wow, I've been on this incredible journey. That was really interesting. I'll have to go and buy a ticket for that fringe show when it comes up. So, you know, it's sure it's easier to spend a tenner on a Facebook ad, um, but it's about a different level of engagement with audiences. And so if you are doing a post-show chat after your first night of the tour in the Everyman, why not get the audio feed from that and put that out on your social media channels? Do you know what I mean? It's additional content that's not costing you really anything to produce, but is added value for the audience. Um, and I, I think trying to think about it in those ways uh, is, is a really useful thing. Um, a lot of us have, have things that we can offer to an audience. Um, and and I, like outside of just the experience of walking into a room at eight o'clock and walking out again at half 10. And I think the more we can think about access to that, the better, because... It, yeah, as a general principle with Rise, we've been really, really diligent about touring um, as much as was humanly possible because um, I was getting tired of work made in Dublin 2 for people from Dublin 2 about people from Dublin 2. And I think that there is a whole swathe of people around the island who deserve top quality work. Um, the great thing about being able to disseminate audio stuff online is not only can you reach every single corner of the country, not only does it get you in a position where if someone doesn't have the money to buy a ticket or if someone doesn't have the money to drive from Donegal and stay over in Dublin and then go back after night at the Abbey, you, you're, you're opening up to people who can't afford to access this stuff otherwise. And I think that's really useful and beneficial, um, not just because it's the right thing to do, but it is growing audience for you, you know? And I think, I think that's, that's a good way to look at it. And so there's, there's that in terms of... Um, in terms of the promotion opportunities, uh, you have to pay for posters, you have to pay for radio ads, you have to pay for all this, all this other stuff. Why not use this as sponsored content? Um, think about what you could get out on those social media channels in advance of the next run of your show, in advance of the next tour, in advance of whatever else that acts as publicity um, and also increases audience development and audience engagement, that they're getting a fuller experience of, of the work, that they no longer just show up because their friend said, hey, you should come and see this, it'll be good, but they're actually buying in and invested into your work. I think it's, it's a useful tool. So the other point I was talking about is archive as well. Um, I, I love having the recorders with me all the time, and I kind of do have them with me all the time in the rehearsal room, because to have that there for a first read through versus what ends up on the stage at the end, if only for archive purposes is interesting, but also for development wise, as you're working on a piece, say you do get a situation where you've, you know, the first 45 minutes of the, the latest draft put together, you can get two friends in a room to read it. In the room, as you hear that for the first time, so much of, you know, your own stuff from me going, oh God, I can't believe I wrote like that, or you can see the mistakes in your work or whatever else, or, oh geez, I wish you wasn't playing it like that, can, over, can kind of complicate things. So to be there in the room is obviously really useful, but to be able to go back, um, to be able to go back after the event on, in the privacy of your own bedroom and listen back to it a little bit more objectively when you're not as you know, embarrassed about putting your own work in the world or you're not as stressed about having missed the bus to get in, in the first place. It, I think that's a really useful thing to have. Uh, that ties back into the devising work as well. That, that, that's, the development of it, I, I think it is really useful. Um, but also uh, purely from an archive point of view, the idea of charting who you are and where you've been through your process. So much of what we make in, in theater and in dance is ephemeral and it's gone after we do it. It's not the same as TV and, and, and film stuff. Um, and so I think having something tangible to hang on to uh, that you can go back and revisit yourself over time is, is a really useful thing for a bit of perspective on uh, a bit of perspective on, on, on your journey as an artist, your, your, your process as an artist. So I think that might be all of the stuff I want to throw at you. Mm -hmm. How would we feel about a few questions? So I've been gathering them up for you, Angus, Excellent. rather than you running through the chat. So I might start from the very beginning. Um, but if anyone has further thing. questions to add, please do put them into the chat. Um, so, so the first question is going back to the Zoom H6. And is this effectively a mini mixer? or a DAW for PC and Mac? So the, the H6 is really useful. It has up to six XLR inputs. So it, it has six channels and there is some editing. There is some editing features on it. Uh, in terms of as a mixer, I, 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 is that question in relation to being operating as, a, as an audio interface? And if so, it, it does. 
So if you wanted to be putting XLRs in, um, that you could have six separate channels for six separate feeds, whether that's from an instrument or a voice or whatever else, uh, that you would then have full control over in a mix afterwards. Um, so what I might do is I might put that back to Finton. If that answers your question, Finton, you might let us know, but equally, if there's a further question that you have from that, uh, come back into us. Um, yeah. So the next one was um, royalty free sound effects and Carl Quinn and Neil actually offered some links within the chat there, which might be useful to people. Um, and I, that's great as well. Please do. This is sharing information amongst each other in a group session as well. Um, the next question is an interesting one and it was about copyright and live stream. Obviously, Angus, you're not. Um, you don't have a law background, so we're not going to quiz you on copyright. But what would be interesting is, is there particular live stream um, platforms that you have used in the past that are easy and navigable to put your content up on? Um, well, so the, the, in terms of the content that I've put out there over the last 10 years, uh, we haven't monetized it as such. So the, the big thing with the, the, the theater podcast, was that we promised we wouldn't ever charge for it. Because to my mind, we were getting enough of a benefit in the work being out there and Rise being in the consciousness of the community and the industry, that that was enough payback for me. Um, but as we move on, so for example, the, the, the COVID commissions that we just did uh, in the last few weeks, that was a situation where I paid all of the artists who made the work out of my own arse pocket. Um, but we offered it to the audience for free, but we also encouraged them that, uh, that they might make a donation to the Civic Artist Emergency Fund. Because I, I, it, this is something I'm quite uncomfortable with because I think, um, so I, oh God, this is gonna get crazy. Right, so I have a real issue with Culture Night because I think whilst off the top of your head, the idea of presenting all this great art and culture to an audience uh, for free so that everyone has access is brilliant. The problem with it is though, the more we reinforce the idea that our work can be offered for free or isn't of value, I think it's a really dangerous thing. Uh, and so I do think the idea of monetizing this stuff is important. So what I'm seeing at the moment is initiatives like The Lock-In, which is a new platform that um, Ross Gaynor, who's an actor, is involved in. And so the, the How We The Rookie Boys, um, Jonesy and Rex Ryan are doing their production of How We The Rookie on this platform where people can buy tickets for a tenor. Uh, it's a live stream and it goes out at a particular, like as if you're at the theater, it goes out at a particular time and whatever else. So, um, and they're looking for people to do their shows. So, uh, and it's a global platform. So if you have something in your ass pocket, you think you could possibly uh, find a way to make it happen, worth checking out the lock in. Again, we'll do the, the link to that. Um, even the idea of the PayPal tip jar on an Instagram live feed or something, uh, I think is worth doing. Um, you're right, I don't have a legal background. So for me, telling people about, you know, buying copyright in perpetuity for, you know, with, again, a lot of the stuff you're going to be doing with your mates. Um, but when it does get more formalized, you would need more expert advice than I can give. Yeah, absolutely. And also they're all applications, as mentioned in that, like Facebook and that, which all have their own um, policies. So yeah. the next question was bringing us back to radio broadcast um carl was just asking if you could talk a little bit more about what a radio broadcast is did i say radio broadcast that i don't know what that means oh okay maybe that was a was a mishearing carl you might let us know what uh, what section would that came from maybe and see if we can figure out what it is and come back to it um, what about tips for recording outside as some of the equipment that you've suggested is something that you can do on the go what is the best way in terms of sound and looking care, taking care of the sound outside? Yeah, okay, so um, this is something we have a little bit of experience on as well. And effectively, um, with the right kind, uh, so rather than the pop filter that you use for VO stuff, if you use what they call a dead cat, because it looks like, you know, the big fluffy um, microphone shield, uh, is, uh, is it, what that'll do is that'll eliminate a lot of the wind. That's, it's essentially it's the wind that'll cause you hassle there. Um, but other than that, recording on kind of on location as such is as effective for radio drama as it is for TV and film. Um, and it's, it's a really useful thing. Um, so provided you have that kind of cover. Now, again, if you're recording just on your iPhone, 
it might be hard to avoid that wind stuff. There are simple and easy uh, mics, particularly from Rode, which is one of the companies that does uh, small mics that will plug directly into an iPhone or, or a smartphone like that, that'll upgrade the quality of it. And you could then get a, a mic shield on that, a windshield on it. Um, but it, you know, it's in the, like I said, in the way they're filming on location, um, it, it, it makes it real and authentic. And you don't need to worry about the, you know, the art design of Grafton Street, because Grafton Street's Grafton Street. Uh, the, sim the similar principle here, that you can, if you go out and record in the field, with the right kind of field recorder, um, you'll, you'll get that authentic sound that you won't get anywhere else. Um, and you know, the good thing about those, those field recorders is particularly when they're in that surround sound mode. I remember the first time playing with the Zoom when I first bought it, we had a small baby in the house, and I recorded it. I was playing around with recording stuff, and we got stuff, and it had the baby crying in it. And like an hour later, when the baby had gone to bed, I was playing it back. And the stereo was so precise that you could hear, hear the baby geographically in the other end of the room. I was like, Jesus Christ, where's the baby? Like, you know, so, um, so you can get really, uh, really authentic sounds like that from, from very basic kit. And recording in the field, I think, is, is absolutely fine. The only thing to watch for is the wind and a simple dead cat wind filter will do that for you. And that's not going to set you back significant money at all. Brilliant. Um, another question was around storing of audio files, which is quite um, a good <laughs> question, considering that if you do build up a bit of content to look after. So is there any way that you kept the Rise production podcast? Yeah, yeah I, have, I have everything. I, and not only do I, so there's a couple of things. The, the joy of MP3s, which we all have on our iPods or iPhones, whatever we have now, is that they're compressed files. So when I would mix together, um, when I would mix together the interview uh, of, the, of the Rise podcast stuff, and I would do it back in the day, the the actual file of the hour, hour and a half long interview with sig tunes and edits and whatever else, um, it comes in, you know, sometimes at like two full gigs or, or two and a half gigs, compressed down to an MP3. You know, you're you're talking about 50, 60 megabytes or whatever. So depending on what you need to hang on to it may not take up much space at all. Um, I've kept all those original takes because all the takes, the original recordings are all at high quality and the full mix out is, is at that higher quality. You know, the question of whether I ever need it or not is kind of, you know, it's, it's unlikely because once you've mixed it down to the MP3, you've edited it together and mixed it out as MP3, it's taken up a much smaller amount of space. And because, the, particularly with the podcast, because it's voice only, um, it can take quite a lot of compression and still maintain very good quality. Whereas if it was a, a 48 piece symphony orchestra, as you crush it down, it, it starts to lose some of the fidelity. So particularly with voice, you can get it very contained. Um, but, you know, essentially what, where I have all those original files, they're just on standalone external hard drives, you know, buy yourself a, a two terabyte hard drive. That's gonna take everything you could ever you know, produce, you're talking about like 2000 there, you like, you'd need a thousand hours or more of audio content, even at that higher res. Um, and you know, you can buy one of those relatively cheap in any um, electronic shop or whatever. So the, the storage, it's not, the, the long and the short of it is, it's not the same as video files. Video files are huge and take a huge amount of space. The audio files don't. And if you're happy enough that the, the mixed out MP3 version of your final product will be sufficient for you to hang on to, then you won't ever have a trouble with it. Brilliant. Um, another question in, do you need a separate card reader for your computer to read Zoom memory cards? Well, here we go. The great thing about a Zoom is it will record directly to an SD card within it. So you can put huge SD cards in and just record all day and record all day at like full quality. Um, and then if your computer has an SD card reader, in it goes. However, all of the Zooms, because they also operate as a USB mic, they just connect to the laptop via USB and effectively they will operate then as an external hard drive. So you don't need any additional equipment for one of the Zooms. You leave the SD card in the Zoom recorder itself, you hook it up via USB, the computer recognizes it as an external hard drive and you fire ahead, download everything then. So here's an interesting one following on kind of from the end of the discussion where you talked about using this as a platform to talk to audience. So this question has come in is just about any tips on how to find your audience if you're launching a new podcast. Yeah, do what I did. <laughs> I don't know exactly what I did. I'll tell you exactly what I did. 
And the, don't forget, this is the guts of 10 years ago. So um, podcasting itself was a little bit more in its infancy, certainly here in Ireland. Um, and what I did was I did the, I did the, the interview podcast and I was really, really careful about who my first half a dozen guests were. They were people who were wildly loved within the industry and very active on social media, just to amplify that viral effect. So it was like Peter Daly, it was Philly McMahon, um, Aoife Splan Hinks in the early days, I think got Paul Reed in the early, like get some good looking fellas as well, never does you any harm, get Paul Reed in there. Um, and because they're the ones that, you know, and again, because a platform like the, the podcast interview was a chance for not only was it me getting the rise brand out there but it was an hour of me going and you're the best writer of all time or you're the best actor of all time aren't you and you did loads of great work so they're keen to share that themselves and get it out there so you know but I, now also I, like i'm being quite flippant about this i did have some good motives for the podcast as well it did achieve those good things too as well as having the fringe benefits for me um so uh so but you know but being smart about that kind of stuff um is is a useful is a useful thing. And, you know, in terms of so yeah, phrases like going viral were an awful lot cooler three months ago. Um, I'm starting to learn what it really means. But the, think about how you can make it as shareable as possible. Um, uh, so whether that's, if you're going to have guests on, have a higher profile guest or a guest who will actively engage in social media and online stuff themselves. If it's going to be just really interesting content, like just, you know, make sure that the first few are really punchy and really get it out there that they will attract people in. Um, and in terms of, you know, if, if you're only starting off, say, and you want to try and reach out to your audience, have, have a clear thing about what you want your audience to be. Because, you know, for most of us, you know, and you always get asked this and, you know, put together a marketing plan for the next tour going, you know, who should come and see this show? Oh, everyone should see my show. There's something for everybody. Cool. I know you think that. We all think that. It ain't true, right? So... <laughs> So be honest with yourself about what, what actually is my demographic. And if you are making extremely niche, experimental, you know, verbatim theater, you know, maybe people who are fans of the board gosh aren't going to be first in line to buy tickets for you. But, but think about how you're doing that. And if you are creating this content, you want to get it out. Like things like Facebook advertising campaigns, you can really tightly curate who that goes to. Like you can choose that um, I want to target women over 45 uh, within 50 kilometers of Dublin who like Druid and Fish Amble and um, black and white movies. Uh, so you, you can curate it that tightly. And, and if, if you need to pay to get that reach in the early days, which will then let it go the organic viral route after that, maybe that's money well spent in terms of finding that audience. Um, but also if at all possible, after every performance, have a poster up in the foyer that says, please tweet your thoughts on the show using the hashtag Engels One Man Hamlet or whatever. It's coming to a theater near you soon. No. Uh, <laughs> uh, but like, you know, in, in, try and actively encourage as much engagement in that because then you can get in, follow that hashtag, follow those accounts on Twitter or on Instagram or on Facebook, whatever else. Try and engage. And, you know, obviously there are issues around GDPR and stuff. But if you, can get, if you can encourage people to sign up for email lists or whatever else, um, if ever you've run a funded campaign and you have those details, go and ask those people, is it okay for us to keep your emails on, on file to contact you about this stuff? And if they say yes, then, you know, again, I'm not an expert on GDPR stuff, so I'm going to be careful about what I say there. But um, there are ways to, to start building that audience and it mm -hmm. can snowball. Brilliant. Well, it's, it's good to know at what point of view you've took from your own podcast to how to build that audience. There's a couple more questions coming in about some of the equipment yes. and some of the tech side of things. So how and where would you, should you, where should you upload your podcast to? I suppose, what are the kind of the names of the platforms that a podcast would go out on? So, um, so, okay, there's a couple of different things with that. Uh, a lot of people would use places like SoundCloud, um, but it's so it, obviously Apple, uh, is one of the, the main sources for podcasts. However, they won't host the podcast for you. You will need to host it somewhere else. So that's where it, it can be useful to have your own website. You can build your own website on one of the square spaces or any of those kind of platforms relatively easily and relatively cheaply, and then host your own stuff there. I mean, I think in 2020, 
I think pretty much if you're serious about what you're doing, and a website is kind of a prerequisite, I would say. And so to have it there as something you can host it on is really great. And then what you're doing is what they call the RSS feed. Uh, you kind of, you're, you're getting the RSS feed, which is what allows people to subscribe to it and it automatically sends it to people. You're getting that out to the, the podcasting platforms like iTunes, like Acast, like um, Spotify um, and SoundCloud and stuff like that. Uh, I, I think for my money, it's money well spent. The other thing to say, and this ties back in with um, the equipment and stuff, as, as well as kind of websites and stuff, don't forget that all of this is a legitimate business expense and so therefore is a tax write-off. So the money you're actually spending isn't as much as you're spending. And if by any chance, because of the amount of self-employed work you do, you're a VAT registered, then you can claim the VAT back as well. So suddenly a 400 pound machine gets closer to 250, 200. And at that point, you know, it, it's, it, it's, not, it's not so bad. So it, it's, it's smart to bear that in mind as you're doing the sums. You may not be VAT registered, you know, you, you, or, or whatever, but even understanding that there's a tax write-off element in this as well, because it's a legitimate business expense, it makes things a little bit more affordable. You know, that's not gonna help the cash flow up front, but you know, when it comes October time, uh, you know, it'll, it'll help a bit. Um, so yeah, I think in terms of hosting it, having your own website to host it on, you can just host it on SoundCloud, that'll be fine. So but it is it, possible to just host it on SoundCloud, for instance, if you didn't have, have a website. Yeah, it is. But I think in, in general terms, it can be smarter to, to spend that money now to get the website because if you get people used to accessing the website and stuff, then when you're trying to reach them to publicize the next show or share video content or whatever else, that they have that place already. You know, but, but certainly, if we're talking about just beginning, no harm in doing it, uh, no harm in doing it on SoundCloud. So a great question in here from uh, Emily, which is a lot of people probably will relate to this, operating from quite an old laptop. And will you have um, an issue with things like editing and maybe the software and downloading it? Uh, the answer to that is I don't think so. I think you're going to be okay. Certainly if you were trying to edit big video files, a six or seven or eight year old laptop is going to feel, it's going to be sluggish because of the RAM and stuff. Um, but I think for audio stuff, again, because you're not dealing with massive files, you should be okay. Um, and like I said, GarageBand is built into the Macs. You can get Audacity for free for PC or indeed for Mac if you want to, if you prefer using it that way. Uh, the access to that kind of free software is out there um, and it should, it should be fine. Um, if not, you can certainly look into the idea of just even just upgrading the RAM on your laptop, which I did on the previous machine. It's harder on Macs, they don't really let you do it anymore. But if you're on a PC, you might well be able to upgrade, um, you know, maybe take out a, a CD drive that you don't use that much anymore and stick in a new solid state hard drive, which will speed things up and maybe boost the RAM as well. You can do that relatively inexpensively um, and you can even do it yourself. If Brilliant. Enough. And um, also somebody else has just said that their laptop is very old and Audacity works great on it. So it's well, good, good to know that other people are managing that as well. Um, are there any other questions that are coming in before we uh, start to wrap up? Um, one thing I would say is that what I will do is I'll put up the info address for Irish Theatre Institute and if there are things that occur to you as the session ends and you have a burning question, please do get on to us. The recording will be available for you to watch again on irishtheatreinstitute.ie and so hopefully this will have been a useful session for you and please do stay in touch with us. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Angus, thank you so much for your time and expertise. Um, it was really good to hear beginning of the podcast, but also for you sharing all of your knowledge in that as well. And thank you everyone for being so generous in the chat and sharing your information that you've gotten as well. Yeah, we absolutely took that actually, so we don't get out of the practice of it. <laughs> Thanks guys, that was great, real pleasure. Thank you. I hope it was a few years. Great.